Stealing Indiana Jones, an essay on inspiration and death and how George Lucas hijacked the greatest stories of our time. Written and narrated by Jay Washburn. To Coulter and Ellie, and those with them who seek the grail. Part 1. The Scene of the Crime. Peru, 1954. Nocturnal screeches and howls fill the Incan jungles. The moon casts a pale glow across the ruins of Machu Picchu, amid which are the white tents of the archaeologists, the invaders. Under cover of night, one shadowy figure sneaks past a tent and heads alone to the tomb of Manco. Only once inside does he dare to ignite his flashlight, which reveals his identity. The man has a serious gaze and a square jaw shadowed with stubble. He wears khaki slacks with a brown leather jacket and a matching felt fedora. It's the fedora that gives him away. From the pouch slung over his shoulder, the hero pulls a stone with strange symbols carved into the face. He looks carefully at it and then shines his flashlight around the tomb's antechamber till he finds the symbol of a sun carved into the stone high overhead, the center of which is made of quartz. He squares up to this mark and points his flashlight directly at the quartz, which causes a beam of light to bounce to another wall inside the tomb. Positioning his flashlight to maintain that beam, he leaves it and follows the shaft of light to a circular indentation in the wall. From his pouch, he then pulls a second artifact, a metallic disc, which fits perfectly into the indentation. As he replaces that missing piece, the beam of light continues shooting across the room onto a third location. As recognition crosses his face, he lets slip a lopsided grin. He proceeds to the spot and pries loose one of the ancient stone bricks from the wall. He squints and sees a faint sheen of gold hidden behind. It's the sunburst. Many would kill to get their hands on it. As he starts to remove the priceless artifact, a noise startles him. He whips around to face the door of the tomb. Another man is now blocking the entrance. A shadowy and bedraggled figure, and his intent to steal the artifact is more than clear. The dim light glints off the revolver in his hand. The intruder points the weapon with deadly aim. My First Adventure, Rural Idaho, 1990 I was a first grader, six years old. Tev and I wandered to the neighbor's house all the time. He would play with a kid named Zach, who was two grades older, which required Tev to move up in maturity. I'd play with a kid named Danny. We were a month apart. He was the youngest of six kids, and we were usually ignored, which made that a lawless place. I remember eating sugar cubes whole. We climbed the huge tree in their front yard, with bark so old and gnarly I'm sure it housed spirits inside. Probably a little dangerous, looking back, to climb so high. They had a triple bunk bed, too, which we also climbed the top of which nearly touched the ceiling. I tried a Nintendo for the first time at their house. Video games were basically illegal at mine. We also played with Zack's Ninja Turtle action figures. He had Bebop and Rocksteady and even the van, some pretty hot commodities, and I think the only activity where we had to be supervised. Danny and I also sneaked into the family room where his older sisters were watching Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which had just been released on VHS. 
With wide eyes, I watched Indy use his dad's grail diary to find clues in the old library. X marks the spot. I also saw the boat brawl through the canals of Venice against a guy with a clue tattooed on his chest. Then they kicked us out, and I didn't get to see the ending. But the magic of that grail diary stuck with me. Indy's dad had filled an entire book with clues leading to a secret. When I got home, I mentioned Indiana Jones to our parents, and they said I'd better not watch anymore because it was too violent and not for kids. But I'd seen a decent amount of it, and I didn't think so. A few days later, Danny and I sneaked into their family room again, and I saw Mola Ram tear out a guy's heart. Yeesh. So maybe it was too violent. By this time, the big sisters were tired of defending innocent youths from the PG rating, and I got to watch basically the whole rest of Temple of Doom. I couldn't believe Indy had discovered a literally underground cult, and I loved how he outsmarted the bad guys by cutting the suspension bridge. But it was more than just the action. Those movies had magic in them an appeal that was, and still is, hard to put into words. Something about them called to me, even as a child, as if Indy's stories concealed a vital secret. And if I were truly penitent, I might discover that secret in real life. Danny's family had an old Gideon Bible kicking around. Nobody seemed to care about it, which I couldn't fathom because it was so similar to Dad's Grail Diary. It felt like the magic of the movies had been transferred, at least in part, to real life, along with the secret contained inside. That book felt like the first clue in an epic quest, one that might conclude with a grand discovery perhaps the secret of everlasting life. They let me play with it without any supervision. My kid brain couldn't find any route to acquiring something like that legitimately, and not having it didn't seem like a reasonable option. So I took the Grail Diary home without asking. I stole it and hid it in the carport closet which smelled like engine oil and wood. I knew better than to take it. I know that for sure. Because usually I told everything to my big brother, Tev, and I didn't dare tell him what I had done. Family Chat, online 2020. Jax, May 12th, 9.32 a.m. The activity was pretty fun last night. And he sends a picture of mom and dad on the couch playing Mario Kart on the Wii. J. 9.42 a.m. No way. Man, looks like mom has a pretty unique controller gripping style. Sue. 9.44 a.m. Nah, mom's doing the classic try to get your car to move by moving the whole controller and your body. Jill, 10.20 a.m. Pray hard for Tevye right now. He's having seizures and an ambulance is coming. Mom, 10.23 a.m. We'll pray. Keep us posted. Was he feeling bad? Sue, 10.28 a.m. What the? What happened? Michael, 11.09 a.m. Oh, gosh, Jill. Sending prayers. Mom, 11.19 a.m. <laughs> Jill just called and said Tevya passed away at the bottom of their driveway with the paramedics working on him. His heart just stopped. Shawnee, 11.19 a.m. What? 
Mom, 11.20 a.m. They tried for 20 minutes to get him going. She is in despair and crying, and I am too. The children don't know yet. She's still at the bottom of the driveway. Someone please call Tanner. He won't check this till tonight. J, 11.23 a.m. I'll call him. Adventure does have a name. Hollywood, 1981. In Treasure of the Sierra Madres, a movie from 1948, Humphrey Bogart wears a hat almost identical to the one worn by Indiana Jones. Aside from that, there's little else in similarity. Just one small yet dashing feature of a costume. Not so with Secret of the Incas. The opening scene of this essay, Peru, 1954, is simply a description of that movie. It feels exactly like Indiana Jones, but it's not. Although the main character is the spitting image of Indy, it's actually Harry Steele, played by Charlton Heston. He's wearing khaki pants, a brown felt fedora, a leather jacket with a pouch slung over the shoulder, and he's hunting ancient tombs for rare artifacts made of gold. It's uncanny how closely the two match. Charlton Heston even has similar features to Harrison Ford, and the occasional shot makes them seem like they could be brothers. These similarities are enough to make fans of Indy at least confused, if not uncomfortable. And that's not even all of them. The two have similar personalities. Although Harry isn't a professor of archaeology, he is an expert on the particular treasure that the story is about. Both are resourceful and solve puzzles that others failed to unlock. And of course, both are eager to adventure in exciting foreign locales. Harry is an unscrupulous rogue. For example, he makes it clear that he's not above stealing things. And every time someone calls him Steel, he asks them to call him by his first name instead, as if maybe he doesn't want to be associated with the word. Indiana Jones makes a similar impression when he sneaks out of his office window rather than confronting his students. Although there are other examples of Indy being devious, the most egregious is that he had an affair with the underaged Marion Ravenwood sometime in the backstory before the first film. Not exactly a white knight. Secret of the Incas premiered in 1954, nearly three whole decades before Raiders of the Lost Ark was released in 1981. It is absolutely certain that Harry Steele staked his claim first. He's the original. And even if the genre tropes and personality traits are not unique, the outfit certainly is. It's his, by rights. Yet, somehow, it no longer belongs to him. Even though Harry Steele's movie came so many years ahead, anyone who sees it now will think he took it from Indy. As Mark Hamill joked, it's an homage, which is a kind word for stealing. Actually, it's called plagiarism the definition of which is to take someone else's ideas or work and pass it off as your own. That's precisely what the filmmakers did. They stole an idea, a unique character costume, without permission, duplicated it, and never gave an ounce of credit. They plagiarized Indiana Jones. How did this happen, and how did they get away with it? In 1966, a movie starring the insanely cool Steve McQueen came out. Its titular hero was named Nevada Smith. Around 1974, George Lucas posed for a photo with his female Alaskan Malamute, a big, fluffy, black-and-white dog he'd named Indiana, which, incidentally, is also the name of Steve McQueen's home state. Roughly five years later, Lucas and Lawrence Kasdan collaborated on the first draft of Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
and they named their hero Indiana Smith. When Spielberg joined the project, he said Indiana Smith was too similar to Nevada Smith, and he convinced Lucas to call the hero Indiana Jones. Nevada and Indiana both follow the pattern of a U.S. state used as a nickname and attached to a common surname. Many others fit this tradition, of which the following are just a few. Alaska Young, Arkansas Dave Rudabaugh, Minnesota Fats, Nebraska Hooper, Tennessee Williams, Texas Jack, Virginia Otis, and Wyoming Knott. A book titled Steve McQueen, The Race of His Life boldly claims that the name Nevada Smith was the original inspiration for Indiana Smith. It's not a huge stretch of the imagination that George Lucas borrowed from Steve McQueen, but the author doesn't cite a source making the story apocryphal. So the question remains, are the similarities deliberate or coincidental? When the credits of Raiders of the Lost Ark scroll, the sixth name that appears on screen is Deborah Nadulman, listed as the costume designer. Obviously, she was intimately involved in making Indy look like Harry. In an interview with the Raider.net, she said, We did watch Secret of the Incas together as a crew several times, and I always thought it strange that the filmmakers did not credit it later as the inspiration for the series. She also joked that Secret of the Incas is, quote, almost a shot for shot of Raiders of the Lost Ark, unquote, which is an obvious exaggeration, but it gets the point across. She's basically saying they took someone else's idea and tried to pass it off as their own, which, again, is the very definition of plagiarism. It's ugly. Seems wrong somehow. Yet, if it is indeed wrong, it's not wrong legally, at least not to certain extents within the United States. And I need to make a disclaimer here that I am not a lawyer and am not offering any legal advice in what I'm about to say. The U.S. Copyright Act of 1976 says, In no case does copyright protection for an original work extend to an idea, concept, principle, or discovery. In simpler terms, this means one can't legally protect an idea. One can, however, protect the expression of an idea, a nuance that doesn't seem too surprising coming from the legal system. This idea-expression concept seems simple enough, but it's complicated in practice, which is why specific examples are often brought before the court. An adventurer risking life and limb to rescue ancient archaeology before the bad guys do is a cool idea. And being an idea, it's up for grabs. Indiana Jones, Lara Croft from Tomb Raider, Nathan Drake from Uncharted, and even Harry Steele are each expressions of this idea, and they are each protected by copyright. Yet if someone were to copy Indiana Jones as closely as he himself copied Harry Steele, a lawsuit would be certain. It would also just feel wrong. So why was that okay the first time, but not a second? The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, Suburban Idaho, 1992 My stolen Grail Diary Gideon Bible was a deep red, almost the color of blood. It was pretty tiny, just ripe for a kid. It included the New Testament and the Psalms and said so in gold lettering on the cover. In the bottom corner, it had a lamp inscribed inside a circle. That seemed like a clue. The promise of illumination, maybe. Indy's mother died when he was 12, surely a pretty traumatic event for him. At that point, his dad, Henry Jones Sr., focused his energies on finding the Holy Grail, the greatest of all quests, which encapsulated the secret of everlasting life, 
and he collected the clues he found inside a diary. My little grail diary was the closest thing I had to that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to ever play with it, too afraid of being caught. But I didn't like keeping secrets from Teb, so I rehearsed a confession in my mind and wanted to confide in him. After all, only the penitent man shall pass. I had to ask Tev what that word meant. It seemed too scary, though. Tev was very honest, even as a boy, and I, apparently, had not kept pace. I agonized over what to do. That's a clear memory. Strangely, though, I can't remember what happened next. If I'd confessed, I would have remembered. It's possible I stole the diary in reverse, sneaking it back to the neighbor's house without anyone knowing. More likely, I just left it hidden till the carport was demolished in the renovations. I just know it was lost. That's another clue. I do, however, remember committing to never again getting my conscience caught in such a vicious trap. Having not been caught, though, relations with the neighbors stayed strong. At some point, Tev and I both got to see all three Indiana Jones films, from Satipo getting skewered alive, to Donovan drinking from the wrong cup and aging instantly into a corpse. All without telling Mom, of course. Our grade school wherewithal couldn't explain the deeper truths to her, that Raiders of the Lost Ark taught humility in the face of higher powers. That Temple of Doom showed the monumental value of human life, particularly of children. And that Last Crusade gave a glimmer of hope in traversing the chasm of grief. Instead, our arguments amounted to something like, the gore isn't that bad, which proved unconvincing. Just so you know, that tactic won't work on me either. We'd been fans of Star Wars since forever, an interest our mom encouraged because of the spiritual themes. Our Indiana Jones fandom went underground, but stayed just as strong. We agreed that these two franchises were the greatest of all time, and it blew my mind when Tev explained that George Lucas had created both. Soon, Tev brought home a copy of the Lucasfilm Fan Club magazine. That's where we learned that Indiana Jones was born on July 1st, 1899, a fact that became so deeply important that I could put it in this essay without having to look it up. Aunt Jen gave us a Last Crusade puzzle, which we assembled together, then glued to a piece of cardboard. To this day, it's hanging in the man cave with one piece missing. Somehow that never struck me as a grim foreshadowing. The summer that I turned nine... 1992, having just completed third grade, was the summer the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles aired on TV. This time around, Tev's arguments became more sophisticated. He explained to Mom that this was about Indy fighting in World War I, where he met great historical figures like Winston Churchill, Pancho Villa, T.E. Lawrence, and Albert Schweitzer. It taught kids history. Plus, it wasn't gory. That finally got Mom on board with Indy. She still wasn't, however, keen on television. We had a TV and a VCR, but our antenna couldn't pick up Channel 6. That left us scrambling every Wednesday at 7 for a place to watch. We only actually caught two episodes that I can remember. One was at Dad's office, but the reception was bad, making the picture mostly static, so it was more of an audio drama. Lucky thing, too, since it was the October 1916 episode where Indy heads to Paris to find women with Remy and falls in love with the temptress Mata Hari, an exotic dancer, courtesan, and German spy. An embarrassing one to watch with Mom looking over your shoulder. We caught our second episode at our cousin Mitch's house. Indy was a spy in Italy and used his leave time to compete for the love of a local named Juliet against his rival, none other than Ernest Hemingway. They pulled the series after two seasons, and our chance to watch seemed lost forever. 
In reality, we had to grow up six years into the future till the series was released on VHS in 1999. Despite almost never having seen the show, Tev and I remained obsessed. We found a pair of young indie compasses at a yard sale and wore them on leather strings around our necks. Mom got us Dixie paper cups with young indie on them, which we tried to never use. At my request, my parents bought me a safari pith helmet on their trip to Africa, one like nine-year-old Indy wears when he meets Teddy Roosevelt. I used that helmet to become young Indiana Jones for Halloween of 1993. Tev borrowed a comic book of young Indy's Egypt adventure from Gary on the hill behind us. It featured a ghastly mummy on the cover, which we made sure not to show Mom, fearing it would remind her of the gore from the movies. Reading that comic was almost as good as having seen the first episode. We also read the books, novelizations of the episodes. I still remember the back cover of The Secret Piece. Wanted. Spy to cross enemy lines. Requirements. Speak French and German. Work and play well with others. Must be cunning, fast on feet, good driver. Strong nerves, a definite plus. After the Grail Dyer incident, I wasn't sure I had strong nerves, but I sure wanted to. The main thing, though, were the trading cards. You know the ones. At the beginning, we had to convince Mom to drive us to King's Department Store. We'd skip the baseball and basketball cards, which even then we realized was nerdy, so we were discreet. One pack cost 99 cents, plus a nickel for tax, paid out of our lawn mowing money. These came with a random set of seven story cards, a hidden treasure card, a 3D image card, plus a pair of 3D glasses. When we discovered that the 7-Eleven near Mitch's house carried them too, we became all the more eager to visit our cousins, and we walked down to that store every chance we got. Together, Tev and I eventually collected almost the entire set of 114 cards, but we were missing one story card, number 93, and one hidden treasure card, Verdun. More missing pieces. Then, as I grew up, I forgot about the cards, and they too were lost. For Tev, the indie obsession drew him deeper into historical research. He was always reading historical fiction and nonfiction, which allowed him to personally meet some of the same figures as Indy. This later became the focus of Tev's bachelor's degree, though he was truly an expert even as a boy. You could say that he was literally walking in Indy's footsteps, becoming Professor Henry Jones Jr., digging deeply into history to find its most valuable hidden treasures. While Tev was reading, I was writing. I stole the Grail Diary because I needed more Indiana Jones. His stories inspired me, and I felt a constant need to find more of that. As I obsessed over this quest, I created grail diaries of my own where I would write things like only the penitent man shall pass and copy down symbols and clues which I found in the real world from the flourishes in the hotel carpet to the single and double daggers used in the Bible's footnotes. All along, I hoped this series of small secrets would lead to some grand secret, perhaps the grail itself, whatever that might mean. At the time, I hadn't the foggiest, but I can tell you now, looking back, ultimately, I aspired to be George Lucas. I didn't want to be a filmmaker, per se, but I did want to create stories as exciting as his. That was the ultimate secret. To create stories that inspired kids to be heroes. Yet, it felt like all the good ideas had been taken. Unable to come up with anything original, I copied the stories I loved. I wrote very short fan fiction. I did a lot of drawing, too, a skill Tev modeled. I leveraged Mom's light box to do this more efficiently. You could place a source drawing on the glass surface and then put a blank paper on top. Once you flipped on the light underneath, you could see the source coming through, which made it easy to trace onto the new page. 
I showed all my work to Tev, and he approved. Sometimes I made small alterations to these tracings and gave the characters new names, trying to make them more my own. But after one of the neighbor kids said the word derivative with a sneer, I felt pretty deflated. He was one of the smart kids, and I knew he was right. When my youngest brother, an infant at the time, scribbled all over my sketches, ruining most of them, I almost didn't care. It seemed fitting. I tucked my diary under a box in my closet and didn't show the drawings to anyone outside of the family. It was true. Nothing I came up with was at all original. I was no George Lucas. I was just a dumb kid who knew how to trace. Death. Phone call 2020. I wish you could have met him. When he died, I was alone at home. I read what mom posted in the family chat. I screamed, no! A pitiful Luke Skywalker. Honestly, it seems stupid now and I feel embarrassed to write it, but I just didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to feel something of that size. I imagined the downstairs neighbors heard me. In a stupor, I called Tanner, as I had promised. He answered on the first ring. Hello? I didn't respond. I couldn't. He waited patiently while hearing me cry. I finally said, Tev passed away. He waited for me to cry more. I pulled myself together just enough to say that it had something to do with his heart and a blood clot, that Mom had posted it in the family chat, and we didn't yet have further details. He then asked if Tev was really gone. I said yes. He said, okay, thank you. I love you, I said. I love you too. After hanging up, I kept sporadically breaking into crying. My body temperature is usually too hot, but I crawled under the covers, freezing. I felt sick not quite enough to throw up. After a few hours, I listened to It's Quiet Uptown on repeat. My chest started to hurt that evening, right under my sternum and all the way up my spine. Literal heartache. I breathed very deeply to try to relieve the pain. And I'm just his brother. I can hardly imagine what it would be like for a wife to lose her husband or a kid to lose his dad. Never before had I felt farther from the whimsical adventures of Indiana Jones. This was real life. It was gritty and harsh, and people who died stayed dead. There was no secret of everlasting life, and no cup of Christ could revive him. I almost hate to tell you all of this. I want you to understand, you of all people have a personal stake in this, even more so than your siblings. For you to understand, you need to know who he was and what he meant to me. And if I pull that off so you really get it, then you're going to feel the awful hurt. Feel it along with me. I feel conflicted about that. Why should I try to share my pain? Tev is buried on a hill overlooking a beautiful rural valley, a pattern of green and yellow farmer's fields stretching in a patchwork. You haven't been there yet, but I'd love to take you sometime. On the day of his funeral, I saw a bird of prey gliding on the wind near the crest of that hill. I wanted that to mean something, maybe an eagle carrying a message from Zeus or a hawk bringing word from Apollo. I wanted the gods to tell me my brother was still out there, that his soul had transcended, unlocking the secret of everlasting life. It was Morpheus who came to me instead, visiting in strange dreams. In one dream, September 12th, 2020, Tev was younger again, pre-high school, and he and I were in mom and dad's front yard. The space was strangely larger than in real life, and there was a huge hole in the lawn, 
like a ten-foot drill bit had borne straight down forever, all the way to hell. We couldn't see what was down there, just darkness. It was dangerous and scary, gaping at us ominously. But we couldn't do anything about it, so we tried to ignore it, even though it was always there next to us, waiting, staring back at us. Tev was swinging his Indiana Jones bullwhip around his head, the ten-foot leather one from our aunt's trip to Mexico. He'd always been so good at cracking it, which required a big brother's strength. But this time he couldn't get it to make a sound. He gave up and asked me gently, Do you remember how to do it? He handed me the whip. I'd never been good at it, but I took it and really heaved to get it going in a circle over my head, against some unseen resistance, like something was missing or broken. I jerked it back as hard as I could and only barely made a pop. I turned to Tev's oldest, who was standing next to us, and felt like I needed to offer some kind of excuse. Tev used to be so good at this, he could pop it so loud... I think the lash is just too worn down. It seemed important that Tev could still crack that whip, and if he couldn't, there needed to be a legitimate reason, a valid excuse. But I struggled to find any justification. That wasn't the only dream. On October 25th, 2021, I experienced this. I didn't think I was even asleep, and yet I thought I heard Tev's voice call my name, trying to wake me. I did wake up and look toward the bedroom door where the sound had come from, but he wasn't there, and it wasn't my wife either. On New Year's Day of 2021, I wrote in my journal, It's like this miniature horror movie every time I think about it. That's still true, every time I think about it. Death itself hangs over my head and stalks in my footsteps. I hate to say it, but you'll face something similar yourself one day. Death comes for us all. While writing this essay, I went to find the chat transcript from the day he died, and as I read through it, I broke down crying, unable to keep it in, just sobbing. Emma, eight years old at the time, saw me, saw my anguish, and asked, why I'd write about it if it was so painful. I couldn't choke out an answer, but this is what I need to tell her. In college, Tev got me a job at the writing center, a place in the library where students could come to be coached on their writing by their student peers, including me and Tev. Sharon Morgan ran the operation, and once a week she'd hold a seminar to teach us instructors how to be better writers. She didn't focus on academic writing, though, which she loathed. Instead, she taught us how to write a type of creative nonfiction she called blood essays. And she taught us the following creed. The hardest things to write about are the most important things to write about. I want you to know that that's why I'm writing this, because it's painful. When I started, I intended to write about where creatives get their inspiration. Just that. I had no intention of writing about Tev. Somehow, though, it became necessary. As if the pain that had been kept secret needed to be brought to light. As a child, I walked in his footsteps. No, that statement's not strong enough. I literally spent all of my formative years emulating my older brother. Same schools, same friends, same sports, same shoes, same exact Eagle Scout project. All of these were me following him. It's captured in a picture of us together, circa 1991, wearing matching jeans and matching striped polos. He shaped nearly every aspect of who I was becoming. He was not only a mentor, but also a peer and friend. He was my pattern to follow into the world of adulthood. And then he was just gone. Part 2 
Bye Bye This Here Anakin Guy, Hollywood, 1999. In 1995, just before 7th grade for me and 9th for Tev, we got Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, a 16-bit point-and-click graphic adventure for PC. Same year we got the internet. This began a social revolution at the Washburn home, in which video games began to be not exactly accepted, but reluctantly tolerated. An effort spearheaded by Tev and me, and the younger kids benefited from our crusade, which culminated in the Mario Kart, noted previously. For better or worse, that's why you live with a different paradigm. Tev and I tag-teamed Fate of Atlantis through the path of wits. Sometimes the puzzles were obscure and nonsensical, but we stuck to it till one of us figured it out. Eventually, we solved all three story branches, if online walkthroughs existed, we weren't aware of them, but we did compare notes with one of our cousins. The gameplay was fun, the story excellent. After that, we played anything and everything from LucasArts, the game studio founded by the practically divine George Lucas. That included Day of the Tentacle, Monkey Island, Full Throttle, Rebel Assault, X-Wing, and Dark Forces. These latter three took us deeper into Star Wars fandom. We learned the names of obscure Star Wars characters like Ponda Baba. We collected the old school action figures, the ones where you'd shove Kenobi's lightsaber up his forearm to make it seem to appear in his hand. In high school, we made lightsaber videos with Tev as the director, i.e. George Lucas, and me and Tanner as Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford. This was back when you had to draw VFX on each frame manually, four clicks of the mouse per frame, and 29 frames per second of footage, extremely tedious and requiring tremendous patience. Yet, it was a small price to pay to hold a lightsaber. Like with Indiana Jones, our devotion to Star Wars ran deep, something almost spiritual. I can't speak for Tev, but I literally tried to develop force powers through physical training and concentration. Luke Skywalker was practically Jesus, the perfect example to follow, at least if you're trying to be a hero. Studying the Force changed my relationship with anger, which is to say that it had an impact on my emotional intelligence. Kind of a big deal for a whimsical space opera. The original trilogy came out before I was born, so I grew up with them, but had never seen them in theaters. Oddly enough, you were born after essentially everything I've discussed here, except for Indy 5, which is just weeks away. In 1997, Tev had just completed his sophomore year of high school, and I was starting as a freshman in the fall. That summer, George Lucas put the Star Wars Special Edition trilogy in theaters, each launching a month apart. Tev and I planned to see all of them on the first day. We went to A New Hope together and were wowed by the changes, which we recognized easily. We got in an argument on the day of The Empire Strikes Back, and I ended up going to the theater alone the next day. I lost more than my first day bragging rights. I don't remember what the fight was about. Here are two of my journal entries from the time. 8 September 1998. Star Wars 1 The Phantom Menace comes out in a few months. I can't wait. 22 September 1998. I downloaded the episode one trailer off of the internet. It is too awesome for words. Of course, by the time you're reading this, it's probably history, right? In May 1999, Tev was graduating high school and aimed at college. I was halfway through high school pretending on occasion to be growing up, but doing my best to avoid it on the inside. The comic book of Phantom Menace leaked online days before, and although I knew it would spoil the ending, I looked anyway. That's another secret I didn't tell Tev, that I already knew someone died in the end. My friend Steve's uncle stood in line and bought a bunch of tickets for the premiere of episode one. This was a week or so before the big day, so I put my ticket inside a plastic case meant to hold a single Indiana Jones card which was too big for a ticket. 
and somehow the sliding around almost completely rubbed off the ticket's ink. I panicked about this vanishing ticket for days, hoping that I could make an argument based on what was barely visible in one corner. While standing in line on the big day, the anxiety almost crushed me. But once the nerds started flowing into the theater, the usher tore my blank ticket without a second glance, and I walked in. It was another Star Wars premiere that I saw without Tev. My friends made fun of the movie, particularly such a goofy and childish character as Jar Jar Binks, though they admitted that the Padres and Darth Maul were pretty good. All the same, I stayed obsessed and kept it to myself that I saw it nine times in theaters. Tev and I did end up seeing it multiple times together, and he understood the magic of it much better than my friends did. I had just finished my freshman year of college when Attack of the Clones premiered in 2002. Tev was living in California, and I went again to the premiere without him. By this point, I was mature enough to shudder at some of the dialogue and acting, which seemed not quite as smart as what I'd hoped for. I also started to notice ways it didn't line up with the original trilogy. Sadly, Around this time, I first started to think of myself as more of a Lord of the Rings fan, as Peter Jackson's Fellowship had come out months prior. In 2005, I went to the Revenge of the Sith premiere with Tev and our three younger brothers. I only saw it once in theaters and twice total, record lows. I kept up on some of the video games and the Clone Wars TV series, but my enthusiasm for Star Wars was on a collision course with the ground, and a void had begun to form. I wanted to be as enchanted as I had been as a kid, wanted to experience that same wonder all over again, and I expected to get this fix from great stories, as great as the old ones from Star Wars and Indiana Jones. I didn't get what I wanted. George Lucas ripped off Dune. Arrakis 10,109. In 1965, in Frank Herbert's Dune, the mother of Paul Atreides said, If you rely on your eyes, your other senses weaken. In 1977, Ben Kenobi said, Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Star Wars could have copied Dune. But looking at just this example, it's a hard case to make. In fact, if this were the only similarity, one could write it off as coincidence. The same goes for C-3PO's line, We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel. Or Luke saying his father was a navigator on a spice freighter. The movie never explains these references, but both could be homages to spice melange which is so prevalent to the world of Dune. And again, maybe not. It's only as more examples pile up that the trend becomes suspicious. Dune was published a full 12 years before the Star Wars debut, and the novel had seen a massive spike in popularity before and leading up to the time that the Star Wars script was written. First, here's a look at the similarities of the magic systems. In Dune, Paul has a mystical ability called the Voice, with which he can command others aloud, and they obey. Ben Kenobi does this same trick in Star Wars when his famous line, These aren't the droids you're looking for, is obeyed by the stormtroopers. The Force and the Voice are both nouns special enough to be preceded by a definite article, the... Herbert also preempted the conflict between the light and dark sides of the Force. Paul says, We're shaped by these forces. When you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see it could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. The settings match as well. Dune takes place on the desert planet of Arrakis, which bears no subtle resemblance to Luke Skywalker's sandy homeworld of Tatooine. But Lucas, perhaps in an attempt to make his story more unique, 
decided to have two suns instead of the two moons that Arrakis has. The stories have moisture farmers in Star Wars and dew collectors in Dune, not quite the same name. They both have sand crawlers, the exact same name. Both stories are about overthrowing a tyrannical empire, Star Wars, or Imperium, Dune, two words that come from the same Latin root. While the next two examples don't apply to 1977 Star Wars, they must be mentioned because they're so egregious. 2019's Mandalorian TV series seems to have made famous the line, This is the way. This sentence and belief is woven into a society of warriors, a reclusive and religiously self-loyal culture. Yet the Fremen, a reclusive native tribe from Dune's Arrakis, repeat similar phrases, including, It's the way, and that is the way, suggesting, with a similar cult-like devotion, that certain things should be accepted without deviation. The Mandalorian also blatantly steals the giant worms of Arrakis that can travel through sand with the same ease as whales through ocean waters, though it's not the first time this concept was hijacked in popular culture. In 1983, Return of the Jedi did some less direct copying with its sarlacc pit buried in the sand, having a mouth that could swallow people whole. Some characters in Star Wars bear strong resemblances to ones from Dune. The similarities between Paul and Luke are undeniable, for example, both have simple biblical names, both train with melee weapons while having access to handguns that shoot lasers, and both have the potential to become superhuman by devoted training to their respective mystical forces. But they're also not particularly unique, as shown in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So no attempts at tie arguments will be made here. Others, however, are easy to pin down. In Children of Dune, from 1976, Herbert wrote about a hybrid being who is half worm with a long tail and a somewhat human face and arms. This hideous creature becomes the god emperor of Dune and wields massive political power despite being constricted by his strange and cumbersome form. He even rides on a movable dais. Visually, Jabba the Hutt is a dead ringer for this god emperor. But Jabba didn't make his first debut until 1983. The idea of a chosen one coming to save everyone is thematic in Dune and in Phantom Menace from 1999, but this is also too generic to bolster the case. Dune introduces a Princess Aaliyah, and by the way, in 1977, before the Death Star run, General Dodonna pronounced Leia as Leah. The villain in Dune turns out to be Paul's grandfather, a big surprise, which is pretty darn close to Vader turning out to be Luke's father. Sorry, those should have come with spoiler warnings. As a final example of character similarities, but without giving too much away, there's a significant heroine in Dune who dies after giving birth to twins, one boy and one girl. Obviously, a similar event is the setup for the entire Star Wars saga, a plot point deeply embedded in 1983. When piled one atop another, these similarities stack quite high. And these are just the ones copied from Dune. Star Wars also copies a plethora of other sources, some of which are even more exact matches than the ones mentioned above. These imitations are so ubiquitous, in fact, that the plagiarism starts to look less shocking, almost commonplace, as if all great stories do this. And the evidence says that, in fact, they have. Eulogy Speech, Country Cemetery 2020 You weren't at the funeral, but because of your namesake, you in particular ought to hear the speech that I gave. So here it is, transcribed in full below. I get emotional when I talk about deeply meaningful things. 
That means this speech might be ten minutes of me standing here weeping in mournful silence, so I brought my new wife up here with me and she's going to read whatever I can't. Losing Tev has been hard, and I'm grateful to have had her companionship and support while suffering through this loss. Now, let me tell you about my big brother Tevya. He was born on July 4th, 1981. Ever since, that holiday has been extra special for me and our family because it's a time to celebrate the things Tev loves, including fireworks and cheesecake. He was the oldest of eight children and the best of big brothers. In so many aspects of life, he led the way for me and our siblings, blazing a trail through many of the difficult unknowns that life had in store. At a scout court of honor, Uncle Ted once shared a Bible verse with Tev and I, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Even back then, I recognized that my big brother had vision. He could see a wider perspective than me. Of course, we still got in plenty of fights along the way, often on the basketball court, and he recently told me that one of the worst insults I ever hurled at him was when I said, You betrayed Neverland. The truth is that, if not for Tev, I never would have glimpsed Neverland in the first place. And he, with the epic scope of his vision, was one of Neverland's noblest. He taught me most of the things a kid needs to know, like that you find the best G.I. Joe guys at yard sales, and how to build Legos way outside of the specs. He was an avid reader from a young age with a penchant for historical works, and reading had a big impact on widening his perspective. I remember him blazing through Louis L'Amour books and wishing I could keep up, which I did not, but it left me with a firm conviction that reading was important and that I could have the same perspectives as my brother by reading. When Tev was in his pre-teens, Dad brought home an old work computer, a Tandy 1000 or something, and we'd load floppy disks into the front, click that latch down over the top, and boot DOS games like Mega Man and Black Cauldron that ran so slow they were barely playable. It sparked Tev's fascination with technology which continued throughout his life. He was the go-to tech expert for many of us here. He also grew into a movie aficionado and loved Indiana Jones and Star Wars, which became central to our sibling culture. In fact, I'm wearing my Luke Skywalker socks right now in Tev's honor. He admired Spielberg and Lucas in particular, and that led Tev to become an amateur filmmaker and media guru. He served a church mission in California's Long Beach from 2000 to 2002, after which he resumed his college career at BYU-Idaho, where he established a lasting group of friends. In fact, I got to be his roommate, and a few of my best friends I met through him. At school, he still dabbled in filmmaking while earning a degree in history, developing his love for past cultures and events. He was named after a character from the musical Fiddler on the Roof, a man who talks to God. And Tev was that sort of man, too. His name created a special place in his heart for Jewish culture and their ancient temple rites in particular. He became a scholar of Christianity and published many of his findings on sacredsymbolic.com, a site he created and through which he shared personal and heartfelt insights with friends and loved ones. He loved learning, and that passion connected him with other people. As we became adults, he introduced me to many of my favorite books, including The Anatomy of Peace. While at school in Rexburg, Idaho, he met Jill, his lovely wife. He'd always been shy and often spoke candidly about his struggle with social anxiety. That meant he hadn't gone on a ton of dates before meeting Jill, but he quickly won her over with his sincerity and goodness. In fact, he surprised some of us by finding such a catch as her on what almost seemed like his first try. There was certainly some daring, some courage required to pursue her, and I'm confident that he could see the victory beyond the struggle, and that drove him forward. 
After a few months of courtship, they were married on December 29, 2007, in the Boise, Idaho LDS Temple. Together, they began adventuring, moving a few times between Utah, Idaho, and Washington. Tev often talked about a book called Essentialism, which he lived by, and that made the vagabond lifestyle a lot easier. He and Jill loved the outdoors, and together they saw many beautiful hikes across the U.S. They also prioritized relationships with their immediate and extended family, making lasting memories with all of them. I mentioned Tev's vision. It's something I've always admired about him. He never let his perspective be constricted by what was plausible or by what could readily be seen in front of us. As kids, he and I built Star Wars Legos long before there was such a thing officially. We built X-Wing starfighters with pieces that had never been designed to sit at an angle like that. One day he got this big idea that he pitched to me. I want to build a Y-Wing, he said. One that is to scale for our action figures. That was much bigger than a Lego guy. I immediately responded with practicality. Won't that make it almost as big as our bedroom? It won't be quite that big, he said. And with that, he and I got to work, putting it together with cardboard, Bic pens, and duct tape. Although we never finished the project, his vision left a lasting impression. It didn't matter if something was hard. What mattered was whether you had the vision to pursue it. He maintained that same creative vision throughout his life. To me, being an entrepreneur always seemed ideal, but much too risky. Not so for Tep. He had too much imagination to be halted by fear. He built several successful online businesses, including one called WP Express, where he created, maintained, and serviced websites for clients around the world. It was not an easy feat, which made his victory all the more impressive, and he got that business to fly. This pursuit pushed him out of his comfort zone in many ways, socially in particular and he became a poised, graceful guest on podcasts and other forums. Having struggled with social anxiety made this another especially noteworthy success. He earned the respect and admiration of his partners, employees, and clients. For years, he dreamed of living a Tim Ferriss lifestyle and having the freedom to work from anywhere in the world. It was another epic dream that most people might consider unrealistic and out of reach, but Tev went for it. In 2019, riding the wings of his entrepreneurship, he became a digital nomad, and he took his family on an unforgettable adventure across Mesoamerica for nearly a year. It is another example he set that I will never forget, and another way I have been inspired to be like my big brother. Tev's most important role in life was that of a husband and father. As the oldest of eight kids, he'd gotten lots of practice with children. When he was a young father, I watched him interact with his newborn son, and Tev was the most tender and kind parent I have ever seen. He taught his son to be the same kind of caring big brother that he had been. Tev was and is proud of who his kids are turning out to be. Then abruptly, unexpectedly, suddenly, Tev was called away, and we're left with the grief of seeing a hero depart. Since that dark day, the words of an Irish folk hymn keep coming to mind, and they feel like they are Tev's own words. But since it falls into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call good night, and joy be to you all. I keep thinking about him constantly, and I feel heavy sorrow in the void of his absence. It's scary. I used to get scared at night when I was a kid. I'd be down on the bottom bunk with the covers pulled tight around my face, leaving only a small hole so I could breathe. 
and my big brother's voice would come from the top bunk, a voice from above telling me it would be okay. He'd tell me I didn't need to be scared. To be honest, I didn't believe him. The monsters in the darkness were too immense. I couldn't imagine eventually getting over it as he told me he had. I felt sure I'd be just that scared forever. He turned out to be right. I stopped being scared when I got older. Now that same thing just happened again. I feel scared. The void left by his absence seems like a monster in the darkness, too immense to escape. From my perspective, my small, mortal, hurt perspective, I don't see how I'm going to be okay with him gone. I'm sure that same feeling is amplified for his kids and especially Jill. It feels like it's going to hurt this bad forever. That life will be just this scary forever. Because all we can see from here is that Tev is gone. But he taught me an important lesson during her epic Lego battles. As the light side and the dark side went head to head, he said, The good guys always win. It usually gets pretty dark in every story, and it seems for a moment that all is lost. But Tev was right. The good guys always win. And if we could see things from where Tev is now, we would see that. As mentioned, he loved studying ancient Israel's temple rites. He taught me that the ceremony represents a path leading upward. In the ritual, one crosses through a veil, leaving one place behind and entering the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This place was meant to represent heaven, the very place where God abides. If you're thinking that means a cloud of white or a pyramid of gold, you're not thinking big enough. You need vision like Tev's. Think of Gondor from Lord of the Rings, a massive structure, and multiply that by the mythological Greek Empyrean and Valhalla of the Vikings. He's in a place so grand and so epic we can't conceive of it. From there, his perspective is different. He can see all the way from one end of eternity to the other. And I'll close with what I think he would say to his family if he could speak from there to here. I know it hurts. A lot. And it's okay to feel that pain. I'm feeling it with you. It's going to be hard for a while. The hardest thing you've ever faced. It will seem like a long time, too. But if you could see what I see... If you could only read the whole story like I can now, you would know that it's going to be okay in the end. The good guys win in the end. They win. I can see it from here. Everything will be okay. And in the meantime, I'll be with you like Obi-Wan, guiding you on your hero's journey till you make it here too. The Last of the Jedi, Hollywood 2017. There's a certain author who I admire. She has even mentored me, which is why it's awkward that I think she's not very good at writing characters, which, if I had to pick, would be the single most important part of a novel, at least personally. I'm not saying world and plot are not important too, but if I had to choose. So... What do I do with this fact, an admiration and friendship mixed with an authentic dislike of this person's art? Well, for one, I try to not talk bad about her. I only share my honest opinion of her art in very private settings. I would certainly never post these opinions on social media. Mostly it's because I really do admire her, in spite of her not exactly writing the types of books that I love. I focus on the things I appreciate, like the elaborate worlds she creates. At the same time, I try to only say things that are exactly true, which means I don't say I absolutely love the latest book. Instead, I say something like, another spectacularly elaborate world, or an author whose world-building skills drastically exceed my own. These are true statements. In short, I try to be diplomatic, publicly, in particular. 
If our roles were reversed, I would deeply appreciate the same courtesy. It's nice to not be blasted by your peers. Criticism is hard, especially when it's uninvited and delivered to the broad public. Even when it's not meant to be personal, it still is. To be fair, this goes against the essayist's creed, which requires you to write about everything and secrets most of all. Yet, it seems honorable to me. After The Last Jedi came out in 2017, Mark Hamill, the man who played the heroic role of Luke Skywalker, sat through many interviews where people asked pointed questions about the movie's controversial nature. He responded candidly, explaining that when he first read the script, his reaction was, Really? That's what they think of Luke? I'm not only in disagreement, I'm insulted. He admitted to having told the director, I hate what you've done with my character. He represented hope. Now he's sort of demoralized. Hamill went on. I said, Jedis don't give up. I mean, if Luke had a problem, he would maybe take a year and try to regroup. But if he made a mistake, he would try to right that wrong. So right there, we had a fundamental difference. That's the crux of my problem. Luke would never say that. I'm sorry. I almost had to think of Luke as another character. Maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. Listen, I still haven't accepted it completely, but it's only a movie. I hope people like it. I hope they don't get upset. Another problem was Luke Skywalker's screen time. Bad enough that he'd almost entirely been excluded from episode 7. And now he was slated to die during 8? Giving him only one movie out of three? So he asked, Can't we push this death off until 9? But his protestations fell on deaf ears. In the end, Hamill was humble and said, I have to put aside my feelings and try to realize the director's feelings the best I can. The director proceeded with what became The Last Jedi. Hamill went on. They say in the script, forget the past, kill it if you have to. And they're doing a pretty good job. As the movie neared release, he said, I hope people are happy and he emphasized the word in a way that made him seem quite doubtful. In another interview, he said, Remember, kids, it's not important if it's high quality, only if it makes money. Just because The Force Awakens made a lot of money, it's not necessarily, ergo, it's good. And, oh my god, I just realized all of this is on film. I shouldn't have gotten that specific. This moment on Cambridge campus exposes the conundrum Hamill faced and still faces. He's active on Twitter and seems like a kind and good person. He's also friends with George Lucas, KK, and many of the other important people who have been involved with the latest Star Wars content. So if he were, in theory, to feel disappointed with some of the creative decisions made by someone on this team, what is he supposed to do? Clips of Hamill's reaction to his role were viewed extensively on YouTube, and a Reddit thread cited dozens of times that he'd said things similar to those above. Yet there seems to have come a turning point at which he realized how potent even his Vegas comments were when he started saying only positive things complimenting the director and others for all the things he truly considered to be good. Yet some hints of disgust still leaked through, including this. What I wish is that they had been more accepting of George Lucas's guidance and advice, because he had an outline for 7, 8, and 9, and it is vastly different to what they have done. He is not the only one who wishes this. At the start of 2015, as The Force Awakens neared release, I famously told my brothers, there is no way it can be worse than the prequel trilogy. In the immortal words of Obi-Wan, I was wrong. Tev and I saw The Force Awakens together with his son and our dad and siblings on opening night, and we sneaked hamburgers into the theater. 
It was a fun outing, but the Washburn critics gave conflicted reviews. Han Solo, in the original trilogy, had the coolest character arc, transforming from a selfish, money-grubbing lone wolf into a person who puts the needs of others above his own. He also becomes General Solo and takes some of the galaxy's problems on his own shoulders. This is beautiful progression. After Return of the Jedi, Han Solo spends decades off-screen. In The Force Awakens, instead of having continued his trajectory and becoming still wiser, a more reliable husband, father, and general, the sort of mentor Kenobi had been to Luke in the original movie, Han apparently reverts to the irresponsible delinquency of A New Hope. He's even wearing almost the exact same outfit. A few years later, The Last Jedi did the same thing to Luke. As Hamill himself explained, the hopeful almost messiah becomes a deadbeat recluse who lost all of his former attributes, particularly his unrelenting hope in human goodness. In other words, instead of showing the trappings of more development and many good stories that we'd missed, we just find these broken and pitiful creatures who seem to have no connection to the trajectory we left them on before. I'm fine with a fall from grace. In fact, I've written these myself. Everyone loves Darth Vader, but Vader's fall wasn't just a flashback. It spans three whole movies. A fall needs to be well justified by the story itself, and these weren't. Especially not two in a row, and not while flippantly trashing two of the most well-beloved characters of cinematic history. As an author who writes character-centered stories and a teacher who's given lectures on this topic, I feel like I'm somewhat qualified to comment on this. It's bad writing. These certainly weren't the inspiring stories I'd been questing for since boyhood. I almost entirely rewrote one of my novels because it didn't do well with beta readers. If I had published that first version... I would have had no room to complain if people didn't like it. It would have been my fault for not carefully watching The Canary. Instead, although it was an immense amount of work, their critical feedback helped me make something better. Hopefully a lot better. This same feedback process is critical for every book I write. You have to listen and pivot. When Mark Hamill read the script of The Last Jedi, he clearly had an adverse reaction. That gave the filmmakers a choice. Be humble and have the patience to delay till we can get a decent script, or don't. In the end, whether the Star Wars sequels are terrible is a matter of opinion, not fact. What is a fact, though, is that I felt deeply disappointed with them. Shockingly so. Worse than the prequels. By 2017, when The Last Jedi came out, that emotional void had expanded to monumental size and threatened to swallow everything. Movies are a big deal in my family, and we spend lots of time critiquing and debating them. Tanner, maybe the only one of us with any sense, refused to see The Last Jedi altogether. Most of the rest of my family agreed with Mark Hamill and me. But Tev, who was away for Christmas, said he liked it. And I didn't know what to do. I was shocked, to say the least. I didn't want to alienate him or gang up on him with the moral majority. So we called an armistice. I held my tongue for 18 days. That was all the way through Christmas break and until January 2nd. Then I couldn't take it any longer. I just couldn't believe my own big brother didn't hate the worst movie of all time. So I unleashed my word horde. We debated, sometimes heatedly, and shared YouTube links that bolstered our opinions. Neither of us budged an inch. 
I'd fallen more than a decade behind Tev on starting a family, and I maintained all the perspectives adjacent to bachelorhood. My lens was that of a disenchanted fan and a critic or cynic. Tev, on the other hand, had gained insights from his distinctly different perspective. He had a son who was almost eight, which meant Tev watched this movie as a dad. That's a drastically different lens, as he explained in a text message. If you can watch The Last Jedi with a little childlike wonder, it's a heck of a movie that does a great job of keeping you guessing. I got chills and laughed and nearly cried. It was the most fun I've had watching a Star Wars movie since I was a kid. And I feel bad for anyone who couldn't watch it the same way. After Tev died, one of my biggest regrets was that I hadn't accepted or forgiven his love of The Last Jedi. I still don't like that movie, and yet it is now an everlasting part of my dead brother. I'm conflicted to this day. I wish I could tell him sorry and that it doesn't matter and that I shouldn't have made such a big deal of it. And good for you for maintaining your childlike wonder. And I'm sorry that I was the one who betrayed Neverland in the end. At the least... I wish I could have been more like Mark Hamill and learned to hold my tongue. So many of our last interactions were wasted arguing about that movie. I just didn't know they would be the last. Okay, so there you have it. That's the first half of Stealing Indiana Jones. And I'll admit that I'm a little worried that it ends on a sour note. But honestly, that's the way with any story, if you cut it in half. The hero's journey always takes the hero through the underworld. And that's where I've taken you so far in this journey. But there's a resolution, a climb back out of the underworld. And much of what has been destroyed in the first half of the story will be redeemed in the second half. Uh, some highlights from the second half are I tell about Tev's foray into filmmaking. I talk about my quest for an authentic Indiana Jones hat. I explain how Monkey Island fits in. I discover the origin of lightsabers, which I honestly think is maybe the coolest thing ever. And in the end, plagiarism is redeemed, and the secret of great stories is uncovered, along with the secret of immortality. So I hope that you will keep listening. I would love to hear what you think of it. You can buy it on Audible. And honestly, if you can't afford it, reach out to me and we'll figure out some kind of a deal. My email is me at jwashburn.com. And also you can get the ebook for free of Stealing Indiana Jones by signing up for my monthly newsletter which you can do at theinformant.jwashburn.com. And you can find links to all of these references in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening.